In this edition, Sam Harris talks about why Clinton lost and why Trump won. He spends the first part talking about the problems Clinton had and some of the reasons why she lost. However, I think the part you will hear is fundamental to her loss. And Sam presents the reason that the media is ignoring why Clinton lost the White House. We knew what the Republicans were going to say about Clinton. Who knows what they would have done to Sanders? It's true that he would have drawn some of the isolationist and anti-establishment vote that went to Trump. And perhaps he would have turned out more voters than Clinton did. And it looks like that could have been decisive. It seems that Hillary got 6 million fewer votes than Obama did in 2012, and 10 million fewer than he got in 2008. So Democrats didn't show up. And I hope all those Bernie supporters who stayed home or who voted for a third party will be paying attention over the next four years. But I share the view that the election was generally a repudiation of the left and of political correctness in particular, as much as it was just a vote for change. It was a repudiation of black and brown identity politics by white identity politics. And it's important to point out that this isn't the same as racism. I don't believe that a majority of the people who voted for Trump were motivated by racism. There are people who voted for Obama twice who voted for Trump. Racism cannot be the best way to explain that. And this is where the prevailing analysis on the left is wrong, of the sort that I just read from David Remnick in The New Yorker. Yes, we have just elected a man who was officially endorsed by the Ku Klux Klan. So you can be sure that every white racist in the country voted for Trump. But there are millions of other decent people who have reasonable concerns about a movement like Black Lives Matter. And most of these people probably voted for Trump, too. These people are not racists. They were simply recoiling from charges of racism and from a toxic brand of identity politics. Much of what has been coming out of the left, not everything, but much of it, particularly about race and about law and order and about Islamophobia and terrorism, about issues that are fundamental to the security of our society, has had all the moral clarity and intellectual honesty of the OJ verdict, which is to say none at all. And I'm confident that many people who don't perceive Trump to be a dangerous con man in the way that I do probably voted for him out of sheer exasperation. They were sick of being called racist for not worrying about Halloween costumes on our Ivy League campuses. So so millions of these people, along with real racists, told all you whinging social justice warriors at Yale and Brown to go fuck yourselves. And can you really blame them? I mean, safe spaces, trigger warnings, new gender pronouns, getting Muslim student groups to deplatform speakers like Ayan Hirsi Ali and Bill Maher. Was that the cause of your generation? That's the trench you are willing to die in? So the question is, would a democratic campaign that leaned even further to the left have prevailed in this situation? I doubt it. And did Sanders have anything sensible to say about foreign policy? Would he have been able to address fears about terrorism? It certainly didn't seem that way at the time. And I suspect that this really is the crux of the issue. At least it's the main reason why even those who saw Trump's flaws didn't care about them. The, The problem that worried me the whole time is the left's total failure to speak honestly about Islam and terrorism and the refugee crisis in Europe. And this, I think, was decisive. Certainly was one of the things that, had it gone the other way, would have given us a different result. Admittedly, it seems strange to cite polls at this point, but what else can I do? The exit polls show that the people who said their primary concerns were terrorism and immigration voted overwhelmingly for Trump, whereas those who were concerned about the economy or foreign policy voted for Clinton. So, It wasn't the economy stupid this time around, though economic fears certainly played a role. And it wasn't just poor whites who supported Trump. The median income of Trump voters 
was $72,000. And I think that in this election, concerns about terrorism and immigration largely boil down to a concern about Islamism and to the fear and distrust provoked by liberal lies about it. Immigration means other things, of course, but I don't think it's mainly that there were a lot of white people whose median income is $72,000 who want to pick strawberries for a living. If my collisions on social media told me anything over the last year, it's that many people were nearly single-issue voters when it came to Islam. I would bet that this accounts for many more people than voted for a third-party candidate, which was also probably decisive. The fact that we have a president who wouldn't even use the phrase Islamic extremism, who could even say things like terrorism has less to do with Islam than any other religion, right? And the fact that Clinton seemed to embrace this delusion, even though she did on occasion use the phrase radical jihadism, as though that made any sense, that was a terrible problem. And of course, the fact that she and her husband had taken tens of millions of dollars from the Saudis and other Islamist regimes didn't help. We couple that with this unexplained desire to increase the number of Syrian refugees by 550% without ever acknowledging what is going wrong in Europe. This was a deal breaker for many people. And I heard from these people endlessly over the last year. And the problem, of course, is that people are right to be worried about Islamism and jihadism. And all the left has offered on this point are lies and sanctimony and charges of racism and bigotry. Worrying about Islam more than any other religion at this moment is not a sign of racism or bigotry. Muslims themselves should be worried more about Islam at this moment than about Mormonism or Anglicanism or Judaism. This is basic human sanity. And most people know it. But Clinton was the sort of politician who in the immediate aftermath of the Orlando massacre spoke only about gun control and then issued grave warnings about a rise in Islamophobia when we had just suffered yet another jihadist atrocity on American soil. This was unforgivably stupid. And I knew it at the time that this was the sort of stupidity that could pave the way for Trump. I even wrote a section of a speech I thought Clinton should give about Islamism and jihadism and put it on my blog. It would have been so easy for her to have made sense on this issue and to have differentiated a sane understanding of jihadism from bigotry against Muslims in general. But she couldn't do it. She wouldn't do it. All of these things contributed to her loss and to the rise of Trump. So the question now is, how do we move forward having declared the next president to be an absolute jackass and a sexual predator? And as I said in a previous podcast, a liar of a sort one would only expect to find in a mental hospital. How do we move from making jokes about placing the nuclear codes in the hands of a dangerous narcissist to actually placing the nuclear codes into his hands? Well, I'm afraid we just do. And we hope that this man who appears to lie about everything has also been lying about how awful a person he is. Okay, let's hope he isn't who he has seemed to be. Let's hope that he really is a cipher. Okay, let's hope that he was only pretending not to believe in climate change. Let's hope that he was only pretending to admire Vladimir Putin. Let's hope that he was only pretending to believe the sorts of conspiracy theories that helped get him elected. Let's hope he really is a con man without any core commitments other than to maintain his own fame and glory. Because then there's a chance that knowledgeable people might be able to influence him. I thought President Obama struck the right note yesterday. Okay, we all must hope for Trump's success at this point. We want his presidency to be a good one. It's as if we're all on an airplane together. 
and the real pilot has died. Okay, and now a man who has never flown an airplane has taken the controls and is attempting an emergency landing. And we're all stuck in the back of the plane. So we're rooting for the man in the cockpit. Of course, before he got his hands on the controls, some of us complained about how unqualified he was. There were a few other people back here with a lot of time spent flying planes. But this guy stormed the cockpit, and now he's in the pilot seat, and the runway is in view, and we are out of time. Okay, so let's hope he's talking to the people in air traffic control. But the problem, of course, is that it actually matters who's in the tower, right? Just, just think about who Trump has surrounded himself with. Rudy Giuliani, Chris Christie, Sarah Palin, Mike Pence. This is a clown car of ideologues and incompetence with a couple of religious maniacs thrown in. But again, we want him to land this plane. Okay, and it doesn't have to be pretty. Okay, it doesn't matter if we all wind up covered in vomit. We will be grateful just to be alive. And I will be very grateful if, after four years, Donald Trump hasn't set back human progress a generation. This all may sound like hyperbole, but who knows what sort of mistakes this man is capable of. And if you said that about Clinton, you were just wrong. Even with all her flaws, we have no idea who Trump is or what he will do. He probably doesn't even know. But we do know that he has less understanding about the responsibilities he's about to assume than any president before him. Indeed, he has less understanding than any candidate most of us have ever conceived of. So, let's hope he's a quick study. And let's hope there are thousands of good people who are willing to work for him. Which brings up a point I saw raised on social media by a few people. No matter how horrified you are by this result, no matter how judgmental you are of the people who enabled him, people like Paul Ryan, you have to hope that the best people available will come forward now and be willing to serve in Trump's administration, people with good reputations and real expertise. So, so we can't afford to question the motives or integrity of anyone who would join this administration. We want the best people who can get in the door. And we have to hope that being president of the United States brings out the best in Donald Trump. Campaigning for the presidency brought out the worst. It showed what he's like as an embattled narcissist and fabulist and demagogue. But now he's won, right? Now he will be surrounded by people seeking the, the warm glow of his power. Now he will inspire fear, right? Actual fear not merely scorn in his critics. He is no longer just a clown. He's the most powerful clown on earth. We have to hope that winning to this degree will pacify some of his demons. Is there a historical or psychological precedent for this? I have no idea. But we're about to find out what happens to a man with a, a famously palpably, visibly unhealthy ego who suddenly triumphs over everyone who ever doubted him. I mean, this was a man when he voted in New York at his polling place, got jeered by a crowd on Tuesday in a city that voted 87% against him. And one day he's going to ride back into town on Air Force One Imagine the way his ego feels right now. I mean, I mean, just imagine the satisfaction Trump will feel when he takes possession of the White House and shows President Obama the door. The first black president who humiliated him in front of all the Washington elites at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. Go watch footage of that. All those laughs at his expense. I mean, Trump has been a punchline for decades. Okay, he's been the Rodney Dangerfield of billionaires. 
Okay, but that moment with Obama at the podium was the worst. And now he gets to tell Barack Hussein Obama to get out of his house and then tear his legacy to shreds. You've got the first black president being shown the door by a man who always questioned his legitimacy in racist terms and who has now been officially endorsed by the KKK. Only Shakespeare could do this moment justice. So, while Trump seems like he could become some sort of Caligula with an iPhone, we have to hope that our democratic institutions will restrain him, and that the awesome responsibilities thrust his way, the responsibility of running a superpower, will bring out the better angels of his nature, if he has any. So I think normalizing this mess might be the best we can do for the time being. I mean, needless to say, a, a pendulum swing into left-wing identity politics will not be helpful, but it seems extremely likely to occur. In fact, it's already happening with these ridiculous protests we're seeing under the banner of Not My President. Good luck with that. How many of you voted for a third party or didn't vote at all? What we need are smart, ethical people in the political center who can defend freedom of speech and science and the norms of civil discourse from their enemies on both the right and the left. And insofar as I can do anything useful in that area, I will do my best. I think Sam presented it perfectly, why Clinton lost, or more correctly, why Trump won. The left or progressives or social justice warriors, or whatever you wish to call them, were the cause of or at least a huge factor in Trump's win. When I think back to when Bernie Sanders lost his platform to speak to Black Lives Matter, a platform that he had earned the right to speak from, and that he was put there by, by the people who supported him, I knew that these people would cause untold damage to everything that they touched. These Black Lives Matter protesters who were insulting the followers of Bernie Sanders, people who would be natural allies of the poor and minorities, were now being compared to the KKK. This SJW crap had gone on far too long, but how stupid was I to think that it would end there? This was just the beginning. These people throughout the campaign, be it in public or on social media, have blocked any type of discussion and have stifled any type of debate. Expressions such as all white people are racists and all men are sexist was poisoning any chance of civil exchange of ideas on real issues. If you didn't support Hillary, you were a sexist. If you didn't support Black Lives Matter, you were a racist. There was no debate on the issue. You were told to check your privilege. And if you attempted to respond to this, then you were blocked. No, de no debate was to be had. Your arguments were second to your race or your sex. No longer were you judged by your beliefs, but the, which group you supported. Identity politics was the rule of the day. Hillary Clinton lost because many Democratic voters stayed at home. They were tired of this poisonous rhetoric and being constantly talked down to. SJWs preferred to win the battle and lose the war. And now they are hosting cry-ins and violent protests. However, because of their ideologies, they will not learn from this. They will continue this scorched earth approach where anyone who disagrees with them is a racist and a, or a bigot or a sexist. But I for one hope their sick ideology dies sooner rather than later. <laughs>